I think many of you will know that the song that Keith just sang is kind of a paraphrase from the book of Daniel where Daniel's three friends were told that if they didn't bow down at the sound of all the instruments and uh, worship the, the great statue that they'd be thrown into the fire. And they replied, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he doesn't, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. I'm reading from John's first letter. Uh, in chapter 2, I'm going to read from verse 18 to 27. And then, surprisingly, I'm going to go over to chapter 4 and read verses 1 through 6. Tim Rhodes and Mur Liebelt are two of our deacons. And next Sunday, they are holding a meet and greet for their deacon families and uh, their friends. It'll take place immediately following service, morning service next Sunday morning. So if you're one of their deacon families, then you're invited. Verse 18 then, John writes, Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One. And all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is the person who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a one is the Antichrist. He or she denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. See that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, even eternal life. I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. In chapter 4, verse 1. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world, and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. And this is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Uh, I haven't skipped out chapter 3 or anything like that, but there is a connection in, in John's themes from the verses in chapter 2 and those that I read in chapter 4. John's letter not only provides a, an effective correction to error and uh, a reassurance to our Christian faith, it also uh, provides us with discernment, a discernment when error comes knocking at our door. 
And uh, John, in the passage that I've read, gives us three helpful tests that we can use to evaluate the claims of would-be teachers in the church. And the first, amazingly, uh, the first test is personal experience. Personal experience. Look down at chapter 2 and verse 20, and you have a a term there that's actually repeated four times in, in the verses I read, but here it is in verse 20. John writes, But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. Well, it may interest you to know that theologians have used up gallons of ink writing about exactly what John meant by the term anointing. Uh, some consider it a reference to the gift of the Holy Spirit. Some suggest it's actually a reference to a baptism. Others say it's a reference to some kind of early Christian creed or catechism. I tend to take the view of those who say John is actually taking a term that the Gnostics used and he's explaining it in Christian terms. In fact, I, I'm quite sure about that. We know from uh, the second century uh, writings that Gnostics used the term, they used that term anointing to refer to their mystical and ecstatic experiences. And I'm quite sure that John is reminding his Christian readers that they too have been anointed. It's not that they don't have something that these other people do, that God has inadvertently forgotten to include them in this anointing. They had their spiritual initiation, they had their spiritual experience, they had their anointing in their conversion. In baptism, in the gift of the Holy Spirit to them. That was their anointing. And they don't have any need of any other anointing because they have the real thing. In other words, what John is doing here, he's contending for the competence of every Christian, no matter how recent, to discern error by comparing it to their own experience of Christian conversion. Look at verse 24, if you will. He says, as for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you, and you don't need anyone to teach you. Now, just a word of caution there. John isn't saying that every Christian gets his or her doctrine by direct hotline from heaven. That's exactly what the Gnostics claimed. What John is doing here is he's appealing to every Christian and every generation to live in the light of that initial experience by which we find the grace of God. And he's trying to help uh, these first century Christians not to be suckered by every promise of some new revelation, some new experience, or some new level of spirituality that has just been discovered. Because God, you really need to keep this in the front of your mind. It's very simple, but it will help you on so many occasions. Because God has nothing more to give us than the Lord Jesus. He has nothing more to give us than Jesus. And he gave us Jesus at our conversion. And all our spiritual development and maturity, believe it or not, is a deepening of that relationship which God himself brought us into at our conversion. And so our Christian life is a deepening of that initial experience of the grace of God. And we don't need anything else. That's our anointing. And if we get a grasp on that, we'll not fall foul to any kind of antichrist who tries to tell us that our conversion wasn't enough and that we need something else that's kind of special or something extra or something more than just knowing and believing Jesus. And that's what's at the crux of this thing. 
No, our personal experience of conversion by the working of God through Jesus Christ the Son and the Holy Spirit is the first test by which we can evaluate the claims of would-be teachers. Let's hear their conversion story. Let's hear who it is they're trusting in. Let's hear who it is that they have their completeness in. You'll find that it's no one or no thing, no thing except the Lord Jesus Christ himself. When God gave us by his grace the Lord Jesus, he gave us everything. And our Christian experience is a deepening of that intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus. Nothing more, nothing less. Next, John gives us another good test. Not a very popular one these days, I'm afraid. But he gives us the test of apostolic doctrine. That's why I read the chapter, uh, the six verses in chapter four, because there is a very close connection. In verses one to three, those three verses in chapter four are significant because in them, John is giving us a primitive creed. Look at verse two. Read it for yourself. Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. And what John is saying is anyone who claims to have the gift of prophecy but cannot assent to that confession of faith, he says it, it's in black and white, is not a prophet of God but of the anti-Christ. In other words, what John is doing is he's setting a doctrinal criteria whereby Christian orthodoxy can be reliably assessed. Can these people admit that Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh? And that test that John promotes hasn't got, I don't know if you noticed it or not, but it hasn't got anything to do with ecstatic utterances or how compelling or charismatic a person may be. The test that John exhorts us to apply is the test of doctrine. The test of doctrine. And specifically, the true prophet will acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ come in the true incarnation of flesh. Now John was a master, of course he he was inspired by the Spirit of God. Indeed, more than that, he was filled with the Spirit of God. And he has chosen his words very, very well because with this one short creedal statement, he's laid bare the very falseness of the Gnostic teachers. Now, no offense to anyone here, but Southern Baptists aren't big on written creeds. We, we don't subscribe to any of the great creeds. The funny thing is, though, it seems that we have a few unwritten ones in our churches. And that's the thing that concerns me most. We want to be sure we're in the place where the unwritten one is the one that, that we are adhering to. Yet the early Christians compiled wonderful doctrinal creeds. Very wonderful statements of faith to define the faith and to defend it against the waves of heresy which sought to divide and ultimately to destroy the church. And I have to say to you, and if there's anyone here who was brought up in another church other than the Southern Baptist group of churches, I think you'll be glad too. I was glad to embrace historic Christian creeds. And I'll tell you why, because they've been very, very helpful to me over my entire life. And the amazing thing is, even before I became a Christian, as a young boy going to church and hearing the Apostles' Creed and hearing the Nicene Creed and the Our Father, let me tell you, that helped me to form a doctrinal basis that helped me when I was a little boy, when everybody believed in God where I grew up. And in the playground, when people expressed their opinions about God, those creeds actually helped me to know what Christianity was all about, even though I wasn't a Christian. Isn't that amazing? But more than that, later as a young Christian, as a young Christian contending for the faith among my young peers, the creeds helped me to separate what were the fundamentals, if you like, of Christian belief, and so to stand and contend for the truth. 
to have them in, 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 in 14 statements from the Trinity of God to the coming again of Jesus Christ and all the major events of God's revelation in history. There they were in 14 statements. They gave me a basic outline and an understanding of the core doctrines of Christianity. And so thank God, thank God for the apostolic teaching that is written and preserved in the scriptures, which are the only thing that form the rule and practice of our faith. It's not Robert's book of order, though that is very helpful in meetings. But it is the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Everything that God wants to reveal to us is in those two Testaments. And that's what forms the faith and practice and is the rule for our church. And when we have some kind of debate, that's the arbitrator. It's the Word of God. Not your opinion, not my opinion, but the Word of God. And I will say, thankfully, in, in all my experience, I've had very few occasions when I've had to contend for a doctrinal a truth. Usually, we spend our time disagreeing about the color of the carpet or whether we should have pews or chairs. And the Bible really isn't very explicit about that. There isn't, it's not as easy to find a chapter and a, a verse. But John helps us counter error by our personal experience of, of Jesus and by apostolic doctrine. And then finally, God gives us the test of godly comparison. Look at verses 5 and 6 in chapter 4. And what John is telling us there in these verses is that the Gnostics were so successful. Here's the reason why. Because they were nothing more than an echo of secular attitudes. They were from the world and so they spoke from the world's viewpoint. That's what John is saying in those verses. And their loose moral attitudes were just one example. At the time of John's writing, morality was very lax across the world. Truth be told, prostitution, homosexuality, even bestiality weren't considered vices. People in the community who indulged in those practices were not seen as odd or criminal or even unethical or immoral. They were simply accepted. And Gnosticism simply reflected the permissive culture of the time. Uh, they didn't bother too much about morality because the flesh was evil and it didn't really matter what you did in the flesh because it wasn't important. What was important was the spirit and your flesh couldn't affect your spirit. So, you know, let it all hang out and do what you like. Hmm. Don't know what to say to you. If you're under 21, that might sound all right. <laughs> The same is true of their philosophy, and this was one of their, their, their cardinals, their philosophy that material is essentially evil and spirit is essentially good. And that kind of dualism, that kind of black and white, that kind of contrast had been dominant in Greek culture for generations. And so the Gnostics were actually no different from the prevailing culture. And the Gnostic penchant for the mystical and ecstatic experience also found a common bond in the first century culture because mystery cults were springing up everywhere. If you like, they were the kind of in thing, a sweeping reaction to the boring reason and intellectualism of previous centuries. People wanted more freedom. They wanted something a little bit more exciting. Now the point that John's making is this. Gnosticism required no change from anyone. There was no need for repentance in their gospel. No need for accepting out-of-date morality, much less inflexible kinds of doctrine. Their church and their gospel was a comfortable place for everyone. And frankly, what it was was nothing less than an invasion of the church by the prevailing culture. 
I remember, I, I have a, 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 quite a, a warm acquaintance with a, a, an Anglican minister in Sydney, Australia. And I remember going to hear his lectures when he was visiting in London at a conservative evangelical group called Proclamation Trust. And uh, he used to tell us that he had an advantage over us free church people because as a, an Australian Anglican, he could do his fishing inside the boat as well as outside because there were so many non-Christians in the church. But John wasn't having any of it. As far as he was concerned, the church was no rubber stamp for the world's agenda. We cannot acquiesce with the world and its standards. And on the contrary, he says, the church and every Christian are meant to be witnesses to the unchanging truth of God. Now I'm talking about the core and fundamental truths that make up what we call the gospel. I think you can be left to make up your own mind or not as to whether you wash your car on Sunday or not. I'm not, I'm not going to argue about that. I, I leave that with you. I don't see that as a fundamental. But there are fundamental things that can never be lost. And this is the very way that the Christians of John's time and every time will be able to distinguish the spirit of truth from the spirit of lie. We need to look at the Gnostics and other uh, teachers and their acolytes and ask, are these people teaching and living out the values, the ethics and the attitudes and the principles of God espoused by the Lord Jesus? and contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament. Do they match up? Have we read it in the scriptures? Is it something that Jesus gave us advice or direction or even command on? Do we see in these people the qualities of the apostles? Their selfless service to Jesus Christ that brought many of them to a martyr's death? Does their lifestyle contradict the way of the world? And just to put it bluntly, are these people any different from the culture they live in? Are they any different from the way of the world around them? Because let's remember, it was the Lord Jesus who said, you are not of the world. My people are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And the comforting thing is this, if that trace of difference is there, if there's that evidence of a swimming against the tide, then there's a strong likelihood that the spirit of truth is at work in you. Then go back into chapter 2 and look at verse 19. This is interesting. It seems that one Gnostic group had voluntarily separated from the main congregation to whom John was writing. Now, I make the point, and I want you to get it strongly, division and fracture in church is always a sad thing. But sometimes it's inevitable. Sometimes it's inevitable because the church is the pillar and the bulwark of the truth and it cannot be a home for error. And so John says this group went out into the world because that's where they belonged. My friends, those Christian churches in California who are refusing to bend to the will and the way of our contemporary worldly culture, they're being castigated and they're being isolated because they refuse to honour the spirit of the age and buckle under the secular pressure. And all I have to say is this, thank God there are very many Christian communities of various kinds which are committed to the spirit of truth. And brothers and sisters, there are many things about conservative, the conservative branch of Christianity and traditional and evangelical and orthodox Christianity in this state where we live. They're not all Baptists. There are people who are holding to the truth in other churches 
People who are swimming against the tide and refusing to acquiesce. They're not all Southern Baptists. There are many different uh, Christian uh, people who are refusing to bend. And you know what? The God's honest truth is that we aggravate and we frustrate the secular majority who live in our state. And they're not the enemy. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I'm not hitting them over the head and saying they're the enemy. They're the mission field. But we're in the minority. And the pressure that we are under, I mean, it's, some of it is very subtle. Some of it is, is very um, above board and, and, and very visible. And it's my estimation that there will be a continuing price to pay for our resoluteness to stick to the standards and the ethics and the principles and the practices of biblical Christianity. And I hope you can join me in this. But if there's a choice, if there's a choice between being loyal to the truth, if there's a choice to being faithful to the unchanging values of God as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, if there's a choice between that and being hip and being popular, popular and all in with the prevailing culture, then I trust that my lot will continue to be with the Lord Jesus and the truth of God that he embodies. And I just want to make a point because you'll hear it a lot. You'll hear people say about, I've got the anointing. I feel the anointing coming. The anointing that John talks about here is the anointing that comes to us at our conversion. As the Spirit of God draws us into the family of God, as he baptizes us into the family of God and bequeaths to us the gift of the Holy Spirit, that's the anointing. It's our conversion. And if we haven't been converted, then we haven't even begun at Christianity. And if you're someone who is not content to get on with the excitement and the adventure of going deeper with the Lord Jesus Christ, deepening that intimate relationship with Jesus that was born at your conversion. If you're looking for something else, well then you're looking in the wrong place. And whatever your emotions feel or whatever you experience, it's got nothing to do with Christianity. And it could, be, could well be the thing that is leading you away from the orthodox and mainstream trust in Jesus Christ as we find it in the 66 books of Old and New Testaments and most especially so as we find it in the words of Jesus Christ, the Son of God who came to earth in the flesh, who was God tabernacling among men. He's our Saviour. He's our Lord. It is He that we're following. And thanks be to God, we got a wonderful anointing when we were birthed into that family through the wonderful generosity of God and his mercy as the Lord Jesus Christ was faithful to his Father, kept the law in every wit and jot and tittle, and who in the prime of his life went to the cross to make himself a sacrifice for our sins. And when God brought us to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he gave us everything there was to give because there's nothing more that God can give than his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's be satisfied with Jesus and let's be excited in Jesus and let's enjoy the fullness of life that comes to us in Jesus. And if you want some excitement and adventure in life, will then be sure to follow the Lord Jesus. Will there be times of dryness? Of course there will, because oftentimes those wilderness, desert times are times of testing, and in fact times when we learn the most about ourselves and the most about the faithfulness of God. We'll continue on next time with the last couple of verses in chapter 2 and the whole of chapter 3 and then we'll possibly have one more sermon after that. Thank you for listening well this morning. Uh, you're very patient uh, and I know that these things can be difficult 
but I do thank you for listening. If anyone has any questions, always feel free to ask me afterwards um, any comments. I, I, I'd be happy to hear from you. We're going to sing a hymn now. You'll notice that a few of the deacons will come down. There'll be a couple of uh, females that will come down. And the reason for that is they're going to be here. Uh, and if anyone requires prayer... Uh, they'll be here to pray for you if you've got a, an urgent question or an urgent need of, of some kind of advice or assistance will then come and see them and they will listen to you they will pray with you and if need be they will direct you to fuller help let's sing our closing hymn